Welcome to Talk Tennis. Today we are going to talk all things junior tennis with Quinn Borchard. We have talked to Quinn before, previously, last year in early 2022, and he kind of spoke to us all about being the parent and a coach of an up-and-coming junior player, and he's back for more, and we're going to hear all about what's been going on since that episode and talk about some stuff that people want to talk about when it comes to junior tennis. So welcome, Quinn. Hello. (laughs) How are you? How's it going, Michelle? Good. You are fresh off a trip from Croatia. How's this week going? How are you guys readjusting? Uh, It's good. I mean, we got back a few days ago from uh, Croatia and kind of closer to like where Pula, Croatia is. I'm not sure if people know where that is, but that's uh, where we work for the Smrikva Bowl. And uh, it was great. Um, We're just kind of adjusting back and uh, just trying to get back into the swing of uh, normal life. Nice. Well, I have uh, some college teammates that are actually from that area. That's really cool. I've heard it's beautiful. We will get into that. If anyone would like to hear Quinn's background, please, I will link the episode right now to go check out his full background. He talks about it and all of that. However, we're going to kind of talk about... James and some of his success and all the trips that you've gotten to go on. So let's just start with this Croatian trip. What was the tournament? How did you guys get in involved? How talk to me from the beginning to the end because it seemed like a trip of a lifetime. And then he per- performed. I mean, played amazing. And just tell me all about it. Okay, so. Um- what it was in Croatia, it was called the Smrkva Bowl. I'm not sure if I'm saying that totally right, but it, um, it is, I mean, I would say consider it basically like the 10 and under world championship. So every every year, so this, this year was the 2013 birth year. So for all the kids that were born in 2013, this is basically the world championship for them. Um, it's run by uh, this gentleman, from Croatia. His name is Mio. Um, he's been doing it for, I think it's 26 years now. Um, it started out as kind of like a team USA versus team world kind of event. And it kind of now kind of morphed into like, a, it's, it is a tournament, but there's, there's a ton of other things that's going on. It's not just like, Hey, we're having a tournament to see who the best player is. It's, it's really more of a, I mean, they say like it's like football, which is more than tennis, um, which I would, absolutely agree with um every day they have some different event um that's going on concurrently with the tournament um which is really awesome um james got in because he won the little mo national championship in um in his boys nines and so um that gets an automatic entry into it um it's mostly mostly the number ones from the countries that they're representing um some you know there's a few that are like number two and and stuff like that and so it was 98 boys and girls um doing that and uh there's a boys and girls tournament they have a they have a like a dingles doubles tournament they've got um a bunch of stuff that you know players of past have donated and um it's really cool i mean like the list of names that have played it, I mean, he, you know, it's, it's, he said he's got about 89 Grand Slam titles from the, from the players that played it. I mean, like in 2013, Carlos Alcaraz, I'm sure people know who he is. Um, in 2013, he was a finalist. Um, Holger Runa played it that year. Mirmir Kekmanovic, Davidovich Fokina, Lloyd Harris, Demon Hour, um, Dominic Team is the winner of it. So it's a decent tournament. Uh, I mean, like a lot, I mean, most of all the Europeans play it. Um, it's a really cool tournament. Like I, I, I can't really express how great it was um, and, and how much that Mio who runs it. I mean, it's, it's literally, he, that's his baby. And it's not just, like I said, it's, it's not just tennis. I mean, like he, he refers to the kids as seeds because they're like growing and, um, and it's, and it's really cool. Like I, I thought the, the vibe was like awesome. It's, and it's not, and it's basically at his house. So it's a three court red clay facility. Um, and the kids are just like hanging out all day. And I mean, you know, I, I thought it was a great experience. Um, there's only been three now American winners 
of it. Wow. Um, and, and, you know, when it turned into more of a tournament form, so like, and James, you know, he won it. So that's, he's, he's one of the three. So pretty cool. I mean, you know, like, yeah, I thought it was, you know, great experience and big time. And I can only assume he's made so many friends and now he has friends all over the world that are also his age and playing and kind of like that he can relate to and keep up with, I would assume. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's it's a really cool thing. And he's met, you know, kids from Japan. He played, you know, kids from Belgium, from Poland, from Spain and, you know, getting to hang out with those kids and they all kind of like, you know, they're, they're going to probably see each other later on in life when they're playing. Um, so for James to get the international experience and, you know, m this was kind of like, yes, let's see how he does, but also like, let's also see, like, let's get the experience of playing internationally and see how big the world is. Um, because in, in America, you can really kind of feel like, oh, well, you know, I'm pretty good. But like when you go out there and you play against the world and you see the other kids and the training and, you know, you get a little bit better vision of what the scope of tennis is um, and, and how, you know, good you have to be and what people are doing and, and how, you know, like different parent stuff, different coaching stuff, different surface stuff. Um all of that stuff. And I thought that was really important for James to experience. Um, and that's what kind of why we did it. And yeah. That's amazing. And then can you talk a little bit about the scoring? Um, it was four, four game sets, correct? Correct. So scoring a little funky, um, definitely different than how it is here in America. So um, in Europe, they're still playing green ball for 10 and under, but that is like the kind of the standard. So James, obviously, like he hasn't done green ball in a while because he plays mostly 12s because um, we don't really have the, the 10s is mostly like kind of like a more of a round robin system with green ball. So he it's green ball um, and the scoring is fast four sets. So if people don't know that it's first of four. Um, if it's four all, it's a tiebreaker. Um, you play two out of three. And then if you split, uh, it's a super tiebreaker to 10. Um, so and it's also no ad scoring. So, I mean, you've got to get out of the blocks pretty quick. Um, if you're not, if, it, if you come out pretty that slow, it, it's going to be a rough day for you. So, um, you know, a little bit of unique ish scoring system in my opinion. Um, but I mean, like, you know, like they've got 98 kids there and three courts. So, yeah. you know, you're, 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 we were there all day and, um, you know, up all into the night. So, but, you know, like I said, really cool. And, you know, just an, a different challenge for James to kind of see what he can do with it. Nice. And we're going to get into kind of like his training and coaching and all of that. But did you approach this in a like, did you have the opportunity to coach him differently because it's a quick fast four set, whatever it's called, a fast four. Um, and also the fact that it was on clay and he plays mostly on hard courts. Did you guys do anything different in that regard? Um, like training didn't, I mean, in all honesty, like training wasn't that much different. Like we're in Southern Cal, obviously there's really not much red clay and the clay that you're going to play on isn't going to be the same conditions that what you see in Europe just because of climate and um, upkeep and stuff like that. And we, we did, we're, we're able to get on a pretty good clay court, a private clay court a couple times, um, which was good. And I thought that was, a, that was, that was pretty close. Um, but you know, the fact of the matter is, it, at 10, 9, 10 years old, I mean, like, it's not like one kid's just going to be so much better on a surface because they, you know, the ball speed isn't quite fast enough and they don't move fast enough quite yet to really gain huge advantages. It was mostly for James to not feel like he was on skates on play and, like, just feel a little bit more comfortable um, playing. So, like, it wasn't, it wasn't too crazy. I mean, like you can't really do a ton being in Southern Cal because it's, the, there's just not a huge clay court scene here. Right. Yeah. And then I want you to tell us about some of the stuff you got to do off the court, because I think that's something that I've been able to witness that you guys do balance the, the fun and the tennis really well. Okay. So yeah. Right. So like uh, a lot of people that may watch this, they may think, okay, well, James is, is number one one in the world now. So like all he does is train and all he does yeah. is play. 
<laughs> and um, it's, I, I would say that's, that's not really that true. I mean, if it's hard because if people know me, like they, they know me that I'm not that I'm not like Mr. Serious guy. Like, I, I mean, it's about experiences and it's about having fun. And I think if you keep it fun and you, it, it keeps you loose and all that, and all that sort of stuff. So, um, it's kind of crazy. We missed our connection flights, um, to Croatia. And so we ended up having a night in Paris, oh. um, which was, which was, you know, I mean, not, not the worst place you could have <laughs> a night in. And so we went to the Eiffel tower. We had, um, you know, dinner on the sidewalk there, um, did all that stuff. And, and that was really cool. And I mean, like I hadn't been to Paris and I thought James thought it was pretty cool. And then, so when we got there, like, he had a buy, so he got one day off. Um, and so, which is a little rare, like you don't really get too many days off. And so we went actually, like the country of Slovenia is actually really close to Croatia. Like for people that know Europe, I like didn't really know that. But um, so that was about, uh, we went to this really awesome cave. I, I, I don't know if I can really even say the name. It's like Pastania Cave. And it's like this enormous cave. Like you take a, like a little train that goes like, you know, two miles in and two miles out into it. And, um, we were there and that was amazing. And that was about an hour and a half drive from where we were. Um, we, the day before the tournament, he was, he was on the giant inflatable things on the Adriatic sea. Nice. Um, <laughs> and with his, with his, uh, American, uh, other American friend, Sammy Hartley, that, that they, they, he was there with and, um, that was super fun. And, and like, like I said, kind of like with that tournament, like they pack in a lot of things. So um, you're playing and then like, you're, you're, you know, like he won like a signed shirt from like the 2022 Wimbledon junior champion. Um, and like there's stuff from, so it's, just, and then there's like a dingles tournament, it's like I said, so like there's a ton of stuff going on um, other than like, just like playing the tournament and then you can hang out and um, yeah, I mean, it was it was definitely tough to kind of negotiate like food stuff in Croatia for That's days. That's what I was going to ask. Doesn't really <laughs> yeah. eat a ton of things, but um, yeah, I mean, but there's you know, I think with tournaments it's hard because you know like you're playing a ton, but then you can you can also find some fun. Like if we were going to go to the water park after the final, but the the, the, oh, the like, closing ceremony kind of was pretty long, so we didn't, didn't end up doing that. But yeah, I mean, you know. Like I, I'm not the guy that just like you just all you do is focus on the tournament. I, I don't really think some people that's great for some people. And I don't think for James or even for me, like it's just it's nice to be able to get to do stuff while you're playing. A hundred percent. Have you watched Breakpoint at all? Um, we watched all the we watched the new episodes while we were in uh, Croatia. Yeah. Oh, nice. Okay, so I'm catching up on the second half, but I just watched the one yesterday with Iga at the U.S. Open, and it's it's so interesting that because I think at this point in my life, I don't know about you, but like for me, tennis needs to be fun for everyone. I don't care your level or your age, but their the Ego's team is so serious. And it's like, this is not a vacation. We are not tourists. It's obviously working for her. I mean, so I- like, <laughs> there, there's two sides of the coin to that. I mean, like, I, I think that, you know, I, I think that obviously for Iga, I mean, she's one in the world. Like, yeah, like that makes sense. And, you know, I, I think you can do both. I really do. Um, just because I, I just like, I think it keeps players loose. I think it, you know, I, I think so. Um, you know, maybe, like I said, people might not agree with me on that. Um, I'm not someone that is, I, I personally can't just do focus on tennis, like on tennis, 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 because it's just, it just, it's just, a, it's ups the pressure way more. I mean, obviously, Iga's in a totally different thing than, like, say, James is. But, you know, I, I think I think it's really important to to balance, especially for, like, you know, James and, like, I mean, who, who knows when we go back to Croatia or whatever. Like, it's a it's an experience of a possible lifetime. So totally. you should really try to make some memories that are off the court. Yeah. Um, you know, and, like, and it was just me and him. So, like, you know, father-son bind, bonding is, is pretty important to have, like, you know, cool experiences that, you know, don't necessarily are, aren't in between the lines, you know? So 
That's what I think. But, you know. <laughs> no, totally. Um, I have another big question kind of around this Croatian tournament, but I want, before I get to that one, I want you to tell us about coming home because it was so adorable. I know oh. your, your wife, your other son, he must've like signed autographs in the airport. Tell me about it. <laughs> okay. So yeah, we flew back from Amsterdam, um, on a long flight, like 10 hours. And then, um, so Lindsay, my wife and Bo, my uh, second son, they made signs and it was like, congratulations, James. And, you know, they were, they were super excited to see us. And, um, you know, I think that made James feel pretty special. And, and the signs were super cute. And, um, you know, I know that Bo really, really missed James a lot. Aww. And he was so excited. Like he was bouncing off the walls and it was, it was hard because like both me and James were just like so tired. Cause like we didn't really sleep the night before. And he wanted to play like so much and we were just like, yeah, yay. But it was great. I mean, it was super fun. I mean, my wife, Lindsay made it really special for James and, and, and I, and she, she deserves so much praise for just, uh, you know, having so much patience with all these trips and all of this stuff. And because it's, it is a big sacrifice for the family to do all this stuff. And especially for Bo who doesn't get to necessarily go to like these things um, and he doesn't necessarily get to play in these things quite yet. Um, so it's, you know, it, it's definitely a sacrifice and, but really nice and special for them to do that for, you know, whole thing. For sure. And we're going to talk about Bo because I, I did see that he competed recently, but then I also am thinking we should discuss a little bit, some parents and coaches, um, what's the right word putting these expectations on young players that really don't come from anywhere valid <laughs> if that makes sense right. um, parents that just basically are like well here's my kid they're gonna be the best or they're gonna I can't keep talking about like I'm, I'm coaching high school tennis varsity girls this season and like parents that will come up and say this is so and so she's going to be on the varsity team and she yet she's never played more than three times what right <laughs> sorry I was just yeah. like wait why are we doing that to these children yeah, anyways, uh, let's talk a little bit about these unrealistic expectations and where they come from. Because they're, it, to me right now, big view, I see very realistic expectations from several, like I would say it's 50-50. Like there are a lot of parents and coaches that are like, cool, my kid's having fun. Let's take it where they want to go. Let's have them decide how far they want to go. And like, let's, let's be a part of their team. But then I also see the other side, coaches as well. Nope, this person's going to be the best. She, she better be this. She better be number one in the 16s. And it's like, she does not have right now on paper any reason for you to say that. I deal with this, obviously, a lot um, in junior tennis. Um, not, hopefully, from not the parents that I, of, of, the, of the juniors that I coach. Is, you know, like, we lay it down pretty, pretty um, it's a pretty concrete thing. So, with the players, if say so, say someone comes to me and says that, okay, and say like, "Hey, I want my kid to be, I don't know, number one, or you know, yeah. whatever, yeah, or, we'll or play that. college tennis, yeah, yeah, whatever. yeah, like yeah. whatever it is." Okay, so then I say, "Okay, well, let's look realistically where they are." Okay, what's their what's their ranking in Southern Cal? What's their UTR? Um, you know, these are these are things, these are metrics that 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 are not subjective. Okay, so like. These are things that are real. You can really, you know, do, do metrically. And mm -hmm. you, you say, okay, well, they're 15 years old and they're a four UTR and they're 130 in Southern Cal. Okay. Well, realistically speaking to be number one, that's going to be really difficult. I can show you right now who, what, what are the players that look like? What, where are they? You know, what, what, what are they going to go to college tennis? Are they going to stay in high school tennis? All that stuff. What are the things that you need to do? OK, like to get to number one, is, is that realistically speaking? No, it's probably not. Um, all of the stuff that I have and this is this is what I do, you know, and this is what has worked for me and my juniors. OK, like I, I have James, who is number one in the world, 2013 birth year. Um, I have his his buddy Taiki is, you know, top 50 in the country. Last year was 500 in the country. 
I have a, a girl, Maddie Cleary, top 15 in the country. I have, you know, so I, I and these are, and the players that I, I really have, like, this is what we do. So whatever the goal is, okay, say, and it's, and it's never, to be honest, like, I don't really love, like, I want to be number one in the world stuff or like not even, but just like, I don't, I, if you want to play college tennis, okay, that's good. That's a good goal. But like, I like goals that are like this year. Mm -hmm. Like, what is this year's goal? Mm -hmm. Okay. So like, what is my UTR goal? Okay. What is my ranking goal? What is my stroke production goal? Okay. And what, and what are the tournaments that I want to get into? What are the tournaments that I want to play? Okay. All of this stuff should be written down. This should all be written down. It should be given to me. Okay. So the thing is, is I think with parents, there's a lot of dreamers out there and it's great to have a dream and mm -hmm. you should have a dream. Absolutely. But with a, a dream without goals, it's just a dream. Okay. How are you going to actually do this? Okay. And, and it's, and it's yearly. It, it should be yearly. Like sometimes it could be even like, you know, every six months and to see and to, to track the progress and see where you are and all that stuff. So if somebody says like, Hey, Quinn, I really want my kid to play college tennis. I say, okay, great. That's a great goal. Okay. Let's look at the players now who are playing college tennis, what their UTR is, what their ranking was, where did, how long did they play? Or, and also the, the, the seniors right now. Okay. So like, so what do you have to be realistically to play college tennis? And then we go from there and we say, okay. And, and that's a really like far away goal. But as soon as you go, okay, well, you want to play, I, like, I want to play at UCLA. Okay. Like say you're a goal and you want to play at UCLA. One of the, one of the best tennis schools in, in the nation. Okay. And, th and that's great. You want to play at UCLA. Love it. Okay. Well then you've got to at least be a 10, 10, five UTR. Um, you've got to be at least top 20 in the country um, to even think about it. And if you're not there and if you're not close, it might be time to adjust expectations and, and, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. and no, like, totally. The, the thing is, is what I don't want people to think is like, Oh, well, I, I failed. I didn't do that. Okay. Well, there are other colleges to play for. You can still play. You can do different things. You can always, the, the goals can always be adjusted and not, not in the feeling of like, Hey, I'm a failure. I didn't make it. And I didn't play for UCLA or I didn't play for, I didn't play pro tennis. Okay. Like, well, and just to interject real quick, the fun thing about stuff like that is like, let's say that player gets to go on a recruiting trip to UCLA and it's just not the right fit. And then they decide maybe like UC Irvine's a better fit, like something like that. And it's like all of a sudden these goals are shifting because of the player and that's what they want. And it's not exactly, it's definitely not a failure. I think it, it's hard as parents because it's hard not to try to do expectations because you're putting so much, some parents putting so much effort and so much money into it mm -hmm. that they do want to see a return of investment. Mm -hmm. And the hard part is in tennis, the return of investment is like maybe not anything. Like it's not going to be anything other than like the intangible stuff. Like, you know, you and me, like we're, we're lifetime tennis players. We're college tennis players. Like, do I feel like, gosh, I wasted my parents' money. Like they never got anything. No, I don't. Like, I, I feel like thank you to my parents for doing that. A, a lifetime of sport, a lifetime of competing, a, you know, and, and, and learning how to face adversity and, and deal with disappointment and deal with losses and all that stuff is makes you into the person that you are. And, you know, like, and not to kind of say like, well, I feel like, you know, athletes really can kind of deal with stuff a little bit better than maybe non-athletes. I think so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? Because I mean, how many times, like, and it's not just, it's not, you know, like the bad players and good players, like how many times have we dealt with times we should have won, but we lost? Like, you know, how many times have we, have we been devastated by losses? How many times have we had great experiences winning? Like, that's just kind of like what shapes you as a person. So 
I understand like with expectations, I get it. Like it's, it's a lot of time. It's a lot of time. It's a lot of money and you really want your kid to, you know, give you a return of investment, but that's the return of investment is, is stuff that can't really be tangible. It can't be seen. And so, um, you know, like 99.999% of the, of the players are not going to make it as a pro and that's okay. But it's, it's, it's kind of what you, what you learned on the way. The journey is really what it is. So. Yes. That's well said. Yes, for sure. And <laughs> it's so interesting. I can, I could honestly flip the coin a tiny bit on you just because I actually have dealt with more uh, feelings of, Mm, not feelings of like not having reached goals, but more like, oh man, maybe I did let my family down. But you know, like that's, <laughs> I know, I know. And it's like, I, I, I'm like, I'm freaking 40 years old and I'm like, ooh, finally coming to terms with some of this. <laughs> like that happened when I was younger. It, it's tough. I mean, like, you know, like I, I never really felt like what my family I thought was, very supportive and everything like that. And, um, and I mean, <laughs> and like, it is what it is. It happened. Like I, I, you know, I wasn't, a, I wasn't, I didn't make it to top 10 in the world. Like yeah, me, I'm know. comfortable with that. Or hundred. Um, or I did. That's just what happened. You know, like, I, yeah, I, no, no, no. no. Um, and like, that's the thing I'm comfortable with it, but I think, um, and it's not even that it's just, I just want people to know that like, sometimes they're actually, there can be, it's not all rainbows and butterflies. If you're just no, like, <laughs> it, it most likely, it most likely isn't like w what we're talking about. If you're investing the money in tennis as a parent, if you're looking for a college scholarship, like, let's be honest, the money you're going to spend is going to be probably more than what the scholarship will be. A hundred percent. And that, and that's just plain truth. Yeah. Does that mean, is it, does that mean it's completely worthless? No, I, I not at all. I, for James and Bo, like if they want to play tennis and that's what they want to do, I'm going to do everything I possibly can yes. for them to play. Yes. And it's not because I want them to be pro or I want them to somehow like, you know, when they're top 10 repay me and all that stuff. No, that is not it at all. It is, it is trying to give your kid an opportunity to do what they love, to do what they want and, and enjoy what they're doing. And that is worth it 1000 times over for me with the expectation of just, you know, just play, well, just and play. Yeah. And have fun. And like, that is mm -hmm. always a huge, I always, I can see it. We can see it looking at your family. It is fun. It is fun first tennis. And that is a good segue into Bo because previously, Bo, well, he's younger, first of all. <laughs> so the attention span's not the same, even, a, you know, even to be like so focused as a 10 year old for James, that's Awesome. But um, talk to me a little bit about Bo and how he's doing. And, if, you know, is he looking up to James? Does he want to be like James? Does he want to play with James? All of that. Talk about the younger Bo. Okay. So yeah. Mr. Bo is seven. Seven. Um, he's about seven and a half. So obviously a little different than James. Okay. So this is kind of like another thing of like, you got to know your own kid and you got to also like be adaptable to how they are, the personality, and kind of also in Tekken fan. Like, James was always a kid that could do, like, at four years old, could do an hour lesson, total, full attention. Bo, not like that. <laughs> Bo was never like that. He still, the attention kind of goes in and out. And But that's just how he is as a unique individual. Okay, so I never was, with James, I was, you know, I did a lot of work with him. With Bo, not as much, because obviously James, but, like, he just couldn't handle that. Like, he just... And I, and I was never, I was always kind of thinking like, is he going to play tennis? I don't know. You know, if he doesn't, that's fine. He can find something else. But like, and I was never really pushing it too much about with him. Like if, if it's five or six, if he could only do 15 minutes of a lesson, that's what we did. And so gradually, like with a little bit of work and stuff with him, just kind of like making sure it's fun and, you know, him playing with James, like gradually he started to get more into it. Um, I, he, I don't think he's into it in the way that James is mm -hmm. still. Um, and so 
and like I said, I mean, like we are not pushing it in the way that like, say like, Oh, you know, James was always like, you could just, you just knew. And so with Bo, you just, you didn't really know because of, of the attention span. And like, he's just kind of like all over the place. He's, he's kind of like, he, he, to me, I always, I always describe him as like a, like a wild squirrel. Like, so if you try to teach tennis, like a wild squirrel, like super cute. And, but like, you know, it kind of comes in and out, but yeah. <laughs> so with Bo, like, it looks like, you know, he's, he's playing a few tournaments at seven and he did, did a little green ball tournament and he's doing good. Like he, he's doing really good. And I think he'll be a player and he'll, he'll probably do pretty well. Um, but it'll be an interesting study. I mean, you know, for all the guys out there that want, you know, that kind of like are looking at James and seeing like how he could fail. I mean, it will be a very good experiment of where we have James who has had a ton of attention and really kind of like, you know, good really early. And then Bo who has had not as much attention um, kind of just like, you know, organically getting into the sport and, and see, you know, see who ends up, you know, doing, doing better and, and all that stuff. But I mean, with Bo, yes. Does he want to be like James? Yes, absolutely. Like, I mean, um, it, it helps. He, he goes to, yeah, I would say over half of James's matches. He sees how James acts. He sees how, you know, the tournaments are. I mean, when he played in the green ball tournament, I mean, he's, he's winning a point going, like, let's go. <laughs> like he learns that from James. Like he, he, he you know yes. he wants to be like his brother he loves his brother his brother's his idol That's awesome. um so you know i i think i think it's cool it's cool to see like we do if we can like we do lessons with Bo with james because he always wants to play with them and james is kind of like his hitting partner and um i think it just i think it's really good just to keep like you know with family stuff i, I think for Bo he needs that um and it just makes it more fun that his brother's there and we're still like we're rallying, but then we're also playing like freeze ball and we're playing like alligator. And so, you know, those things are, we're still having room for fun. Um, because, you know, like as a coach, you you kind of really need to know the room and you got to know, like if I was to grind bow, like cross four forehands, like let's make 40, it's not going to work. Like we're not there. Yeah. Like, you know, and, and the kid will, the kid will know, you'll know when you, when you're there and, you know, Bo's not there and that's okay. And he's only seven. Yeah. So like, I just want him to, you know, like in the green ball tournament, like he wasn't even entered in the tournament. It was at the, at our club. And like, I looked at it and I was like, Hey, you want to play today? And you know, an hour before, and he's like, yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, and I was like, okay, great. So like that sort of stuff, you know, is, is I think good for him. And so, um, yeah, I mean, we'll see. I, I think he, he's, he's gonna, he looks like he enjoys playing and he, um, you know, I, I think it's kind of at this point, it's kind of like a family thing we do that it's not just like a, you know, like, Hey, you must play tennis. It's like, it's just kind of like, it's woven into the fabric of our family. Yeah. And it's also a good reminder. It seems obvious, but there is no cookie cutter answer for anyone. <laughs> Everyone's no. going to be completely unique and different. And what works for one person might not work for the other. And yeah, everything in between. So that's good perspective. Because I think some people just think like, oh, wow, well, this coach, you know, perform like pushed out this player. And like, if I just send my kid to that coach... They have to be, you know, but that coach might not be able to speak the same language. I mean, obviously English, but like I, I know the way I learn is not the way, you know, the person next to me might learn. And someone telling me how to hit a forehand might not resonate. I literally have to do it and it will go in one ear out the other. But if you're showing me and I'm doing it in the muscle, you know, so everyone's different. Yeah. I mean, and I think as a coach, you need to really be flexible with that um, because it is true. I mean, like even players of the same ability learn differently and some can be pushed. Some can, some, if you push them, they push you away. Like in, in, in you know, I have, there's players I work with every day and like, they're all different. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you're not adapting and, and flexible to that, then it's going to be really tough. Uh, agreed. Um, 
I have a little one that I work with, and it's her and her sister. It kind of reminds me of your two, but a lot fresher to tennis. But the older one is, like, so disciplined, and, like, anything you ask her to do, she's like, yes, and, like, asking for extra time. And then <laughs> Naomi, the littler one, I think she's six or seven she is a little spitball of energy and she wants to do everything but hit the ball but then you like find a way that like you create the competition and she's just like locked in and it's so cute that's awesome yeah, <laughs> yeah. very cool yeah um okay let's talk about maybe another controversial topic let's talk about what kind of gear James is using, and if anything has changed since last time we spoke. Also, I am going to give him a shout out because I feel like this has got to be a trend that's happening on the junior tennis scene. The tennis shoes. Did he do that on his own? He, he does like one color and then a different color. So, okay. Or do you that do that? <laughs> so that, I used to do that. No, but like, did bit. he know that you did that? Um, It was more kind of like, I told him, I'm like, you know, you don't have to do the same shoes. You can do, if, if they're the same shoe, different <laughs> color. So it doesn't really matter. Right. So you could do different colors if you like. It's because, you know, with, with him, like we got to get a bunch of shoes like all the time because he's just wearing them out. So I was like, if you want, you can. And then he's like, okay. And then like, it's kind of, that's kind of been a thing. Nice. Um, I love it. So, you know, like, I, I think it's cool. I mean, I mean, I do it. I do it now with my shoes, and people either think I'm dressing in the dark or like, <laughs> you know. I mean, you see it in the NBA. Like, it, there's different colors of, of shoes on different right and left. So, I mean, like, I don't really. I, I've always thought like I don't think it's that huge of a deal, but it's cool. Um, but yeah, James is kind of he's been doing that for a while, and, and so then, it's cool. Yeah, I, I think it's really awesome. Um, and then let's talk about his gear. Is he still using a junior racket? He was in the Yonex, one of the Yonexes. Okay, so this is where we can get really specific here. Yes. Um, it's like, people may not know, I, I'm a pretty big gearhead. Like, I'm really, I would say I'm I'm pretty knowledgeable when it, when it comes to it. Um, probably not as knowledgeable as some people, but uh, I feel like I, I kind of follow the stuff going on pretty good. So and especially with James, like, it's not like I'm just doing this on my own. I, I, I've yeah. actually, this is a, because of all of the stuff with equipment, it's really, really important, especially with a growing younger player. Yeah. Um, every decision I make is carefully thought out um, with input from different experts. I, I have consulted with a few like racket tenant gurus out there. Um, and so, and just to see like if like what they were thinking and I was thinking and like how that would work. Um, you know, shout out to Matt Pervetti, Pervetti um, in, in San Diego. He's a master kind of racket guy. Um, he kind of helped kind of with like that because the big thing was is the change from the 26 to the 27. So the junior racket to the regular racket. Um, James was a pretty, I would say out of all the kids of his birth year, he was probably the last-ish guy to change into a 27. He changed into a 27 about four months ago. So that was kind of a big deal um, because it's really, really hard to find this racket because when it goes from 26 to 27, the weight change is really, really actually pretty significant. Um, in my opinion, I think when you go from like a 20 to 25 gram change, it's, it's really, really significant. Um, especially with what I see of his age group stuff. I, 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 in my opinion, I see kids with rackets that look too big, um, where the racket is swinging the player and not the player swinging mm -hmm. the racket. I see it in probably 80% of the players, his age. I would say that that's what it looks like. Um, also, it's really hard because a lot of people don't really take into account arm length. Um, and with James having really, really long arms, um, like kind of almost abnormally long, long arms, he's always looked like the 26 always looked normal. Mm -hmm. And then when he switched to a 20, when it was a 27, it always looked a little unwieldy. And like, it was kind of like that was, that was a major concern with me because I didn't want him to switch to a bigger racket, longer racket, 
and risk injury risk and all that stuff. So it was, it was a thing, but it was kind of like a necessary thing as he's playing stronger, older players. Um, it was kind of like the crazy thing. Uh, I mean, you're going to think I'm crazy. So. <laughs> Me? I don't think I will. I mean, I'm around the geeked out tennis world all day. <laughs> this so, sounds completely normal to me. <laughs> so what I did was the first one is that we went from 26 to like, I found a racket that kind of was a little shorter than 27. And then when they get strong, they compress, right? So like it ended up being like a 26.8 inch racket. Um and I tried that out with him on that one, and that seemed good. So it was kind of like we had a couple of those. So he switched from the 26 to like, and like, shout out to Yannick for making these little incremental weight rackets. Because um, he's in a, he's a kind of in a funky one that like not a lot of people use. He's in a Yannick's V Core feel, which is like super light 27. Um, and so that one was really good. So I kind of like, I, we did like two weeks with him in the 26.8 and then we've kept that racket. And then like, I had a couple like actual 27s and he kind of like cycles between those mm -hmm. um, because they do kind of compress, you, you know how it is. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was kind of the major change. Um, James is now full Yonix everything. So um, he's, Yonix strings, Yonix clothes, Yonix shoes, Yonix racket, everything Yonix. Um, and thank you, Yonix, for supporting him. <laughs> as I think he's like their youngest guy. Um, and so they've been really good. Uh, shout out to Luana uh, at Team Yonix. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, so like he, he switched from um, Selenko Hyper G 18 to Yonix Poly Tour Pro 18. Uh, strung at 42. So um, anyone that wants to question any of the stuff that I do, I am more than willing and happy to talk about this stuff. Actually, there are people that message me on Instagram, you know, monthly <laughs> out of nowhere, asking me questions about this, like sort of stuff with James and all this stuff. And I'm more than willing to talk to you about it. If you want to get at me, Quinn Borchard on Instagram, you can, you can message me and ask me, like, why would I do these things? Why would you do these things? And I'll, I'll give you an answer, and you can agree or disagree with me. I'm, I'm totally fine with it. But, um, yeah, he's, he's, in, he's in a poly, 18, 18 gauge, 42, um, hasn't had any arm problems and any injury issues. Uh, not yet. So, um, <laughs> you know, I'm sure he'll, his arm will fall off uh, when he's 16 years old. Um, I mean, if our yeah. arms didn't fall off, well, I guess Polly came later, but <laughs> yeah. And so, <laughs> I think you, know, it's okay. you know, I mean, like that's kind of everyone I've talked to who are, you know, racket experts. No one has told me like, oh my God, what are you doing? Um, all, all of the, all of the stuff that I, I do when it comes to James's like equipment stuff is it's very, de I mean, decently thought out. I, I hope, you know, I'm yeah. not just kind of throwing things out there. Um, so yeah, I was going to say, I'm going to pull up the poly tour. It's poly tour pro, right? The stiffness rating is C. Well, we don't have 18 on the database, but it's under 200, um, when it comes to stiffness, which is low. It's a, right. Um, and then you string it at 42. I mean, like, at 42. You know, yeah. It feels like I'm pushing. Mean, I will say the the interesting one is that he has yellow in the main and blue in the cross at the well, same was, string because, because he, he wanted say. to have different colors. So. Um, and shout out for anyone listening because we just reviewed it this week. A poly tour air is one of the softest polyester strings and one of the softest strings that has ever been tested in the tennis warehouse database. So there you go. It's poly, literally poly, not not killing your arm as much as we thought. Exactly. Um, and knowing that you're in charge of the gear and equipment, I'm assuming he is restringing fairly often. Is he breaking strings often? He's breaking strings. Like it's probably like once a week, week and a half. I oh, mean, like, wow. Yeah. I mean, with the 18 gauge, it's, it's, it's gonna, it's gonna yeah. pop. Um, so it's fresh. And, so and like, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, 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 
him crazy. So, I mean, like, most, like, every time he's, he's getting his racket strung, like, pretty much weekly. Like, when he goes to a tournament, it's pretty much going to be freshly strung. He does, he's kind of, he is, like, your typical tennis player where he has, like, one racket that he likes. And, like, if he's been playing with it for four days, I'm, I'm not necessarily super pumped for him to play a tournament with it, but like you kind of have to go with the player sometimes, <laughs> yeah. um, but he will have, he'll have a fresh one ready. Um, I'm definitely more, you know, when it comes to that sort of stuff than most parents or stuff like that. But I mean, I think it, I mean, with Polly's like, I mean, like, to be honest, like, especially when you have like an 18 gauge of 42 pounds, like it shouldn't be in the racket for more than like a week, week and a half, maybe. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's, that makes sense. it's pretty much done by then. Yeah, yeah. So, don't send child protective services. <laughs> you can. I mean, like, yeah. I, mean, like, I, I I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely fine. Like, trust me. Like, no one is con- is concerned more w- about my kid than myself. Okay? Yeah. Like, so like, if you want to debate like equipment stuff, that like, I'm I'm absolutely fine with that. Like, trust me. I I'm as I'm as worried and scared as every as anyone else could be um you know but i feel like my decisions are sound and um based with you know some research i'm not just kind of throwing it in there i'm not like going like hey james like you're gonna play 15 gauge poly at 58 pounds and like you know just make it happen yeah yeah yeah. in the v-core pro or the v-core 95 (laughs) yeah well and uh, you mentioned because i don't know if a lot of people do know this that aren't as into gear as we are but when switching from a junior to an adult rack, or a junior to 27, um, I think a lot of people, like, let's say they see, okay, James is in the red junior Yonex racket, and then they just automatically will put the player into the V-Core 100. And they don't realize that there's, like, other options in that family or other rackets that are lighter or might be a better fit. And it is a bit confusing because then you're like, ooh, what's this Yonex feel? Like, you know, and right. and then most coaches not most, but there are some coaches out there that don't know a ton about gear and they just kind of know what's out there and they'll just say, get the red Yonex. And the player just goes and gets the red Yonex and calls up tennis warehouses as the red one. And they say, you know, so it is definitely worth doing research when. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, you're talking, <laughs> to, you're talking to me who like, I think racket change and I think racket, um, selection and string selection are really really important and as a coach coaching juniors you should really be really aware as to all that stuff because i mean these racket companies make these rackets for these particular reasons Mm -hmm. like they don't just make one racket and just like hope to god like that that's the one that you have like you know like these come the companies make these rackets for different particular demographics and so like every single player that I have and I do consult with other players of different other, because I do get questions from parents of maybe people that I don't teach, Mm -hmm. but they know, they know kind of like how I am. And and so they'll say, well, what do you think of this? And, you know, like, and, and, and that sort of stuff. And I feel like the step up of different, like the ultra light and the light and the, and all that stuff, I think it it is pretty significant and it's, I've seen players that can just like, you know, do the regular hundred and be fine. And I, I, but I I feel like, especially with like growing juniors, like it's kind of, it is, it is pretty important. And I think you should try to consult with someone who knows more about that stuff, whether it be a coach, whether it be um, a racket technician at a store, whether it be tennis warehouse, um, that sort of stuff. I, I really feel like, especially if you have like a junior from like ages of eight to like 16, like it's, it's, it's important. I mean, like, I know like for me, like I just, I played with whatever I liked and thought was cool. Mm -hmm. And like, even in college, like I made really, really poor um, selections gear wise that really did lead to injury stuff. um, What did you play with in college? If you don't mind me asking. (sighs) I mean, like, in college, like I was playing full Kevlar because <laughs> I didn't want to break a string um, because I didn't want to get it strung um, and pay money. So I was playing full Kevlar at like, mm-hmm. I don't know, like 55. 
easy. Um, yeah. <laughs> with like the pro staff six one and like, you know, like weirdly enough, like my arm hurt, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, <sighs> and so, um, but I was like a dumb college kid, you know, like I didn't want to spend money on stringing rackets and, and that stuff. So, I mean, like that, th those are poor choices. Um, <laughs> and it would have been nice to, you know, know more about this stuff. And I think it's, it's important to at least have somebody that really does know and who is in the industry, who, who deals with it every day that, you know, you can kind of like count on to like give you some, and, and to be honest, like most of the racket store owners, they're really good. Like every, every single like shop owner and shop like um, person usually that I've dealt with has been very good, very knowledgeable. And they do understand what's going on. I mean, that's kind of their trade and they should know. Um, and so they, they do do pretty good suggestions. So I think if you have questions, you should always ask. Yeah. Um, and, you know. Yeah. Well, and there's so much more information available, readily available now. So if you can't sleep at night, you can be like looking up for a status of rackets, like stiffness ratings and all that. We didn't have that back in the day. So there are a lot more opportunities to be educated, which is great. And like you said, uh, people are the people that are educated are happy to help. Um, Absolutely. I, that's, what they yeah. like, that's what they like to do. Yeah. They, yeah. They could talk to you forever. <laughs> and again, it's that whole one size does not fit all here. Like what works for James might not work for your 10 year old. So um, Absolutely. You, you really have to be hands on for the most success. But oh my goodness, we could literally talk about these kinds of topics all day or I could at least I think you probably could as well. Um, but I know I've taken a bunch of your time before we wrap this. I have to know what are you currently hitting with? What's your equipment? And last time we spoke, you were doing a little bit of the pickleball, but I feel like you're all in on tennis right now. So what's the status? Okay. My status is basically, um, don't think of me much of as like an individual. Think of me as like a vessel of coaching at this point. <laughs> um, what racket are you feeding with <laughs> or yelling? Um, so I'm playing with the the E Zone Hundred um, nice. extended one. Yes. If I ever play again, um, <laughs> and so yeah, I mean, but I mean, like if you look at my racket right now, it is like the grip, like the replace the the actual sock grip is like part of it's off. Um, <laughs> I don't. I haven't. You know, like it's it's just I'm sometimes I'm I'm sometimes I actually I'm hitting a lot now um, with the, the kids, but um, yeah, it's. I like, I like that one. That's a good racket. I mean, you, you know, Yonex has been really good to us. Um, and, uh, they, they give the, you know, drive me with rackets. I like that racket. Uh, the Ezone's pretty good and an easy, easy racket to play with. Um, and I, I, I like it. So, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I, for me, like, yeah, I was doing pickleball was for a while. Um, I don't have really any time yeah. um, now. Like I'm pretty much, I'm pretty much gone almost every weekend for a tournament either with James or with any of my other students. Um, I feel like I'm like usually doing all that stuff with them or with Bo. Um, so yeah, I mean like I'm kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm Mr. Coach now. Yes. I mean the coach, Quinn, the player and Quinn, the stuff is, is kind of on hold. Um, that will I'm sure come back again. Um, oh, it's not like I don't like playing. I still would love to play. Um, I still play with, uh, the kids and I'm sure as they get better, I'll get a ton better. I'm sure I I'm planning to do the 40 nationals doubles. Um, so we'll see. I was going to say, and then national father, son, watch out. <laughs> well, the, the good part is it's at the same time. So, oh, nice. you, can, so you can do that. So like, I'm, I'm going to be there for father, son. So might as well do the forties. And then you have you a built-in hitting partner, warm-up partner, and everything. Look at that. I know. You can't, can't beat it. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, you can't beat it. Um, and we're heading into, well, it is summer. And uh, that usually in tennis world means lots of tournaments, nationals, clay courts, all of the things. So what is on the agenda for you and James this summer? So uh, James is going to go to Alabama for the, uh, the level one uh, national hard courts. Um, that's in Mobile. That's at the 60 court facility that USDA has. Um, really great tournament. Uh, James played it last year. 
they do an incredible job. Um, you know, that's my favorite junior tournament other than Kalamazoo, um, which is also another great tournament. Um, he's going to be doing that. Um, you know, playing some local stuff here in Southern Cal. Um, and then there's always more tournaments. Yeah. Um, just kind of just trying to build and see where he's going to go. And then he'll just kind of do it again. He's not going to do, he's not going to do like the orange bowl already heard this year. Um, he'll probably do it maybe next year or the year after. So um, just, you know, just playing and seeing what's going on. And then last but not least, have you guys like locked down that Jimmy John sponsorship? It's Jersey Mike's, dude. Oh, man. I was like, I don't know which sandwich you it is. <laughs> you always say Jimmy John. You always say Jimmy John. I don't eat sandwiches. <laughs> uh, cause it's Jimmy How do you not eat sandwiches? Because I, I, uh, I don't know. The bread and the carbs. <laughs> Who doesn't like not eat sandwiches? Um, okay. Also, have you ever Anyways. been to Slow and had High Street Deli? That's why. <laughs> Um, no, I Oh, have. man. Next time you guys are up here, Avila Tournament. <laughs> okay, Jersey Mike's. Dang it. Um, have you locked in that sponsorship? Dude, dude, working on it. Um, okay. Working on it. I, 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 maybe one day. I, I heard mean, that their ambassadorship that the thing, bro, is in open. Croatia, like in Croatia, there wasn't any Jersey Mike's. We didn't know what to do. <laughs> That's so. so funny. Yeah, I mean, like, he eats it, like, I don't know, maybe, like, four or five times a week. So, yeah, like, Jersey Mike's, come on. Jersey Mike's. Sponsor James. Sponsor that man. We will There's no one that likes Jersey Mike's more than James. And he'd be such a great representative. Athlete, Jersey Mike's, cool kid, wears different color shoes. Like, I mean, it's a win-win. I, mean, I, I, I agree. <laughs> I, I, I like what you're saying. I, I'm into it. We're working on it. I'm always working on a sponsor that's, like, a little outside of the tennis world. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm, I'm – you're not the first person who, who, is, who has asked about that. Um, I, I – Maybe one day. Maybe. <laughs> okay. Fingers crossed. We'll, we'll keep keep manifesting that for James. <laughs> that's that's where we're going. That's a goal for 2023. <laughs> Write it down. Um, okay. <laughs> Quinn, thank you. Again, give everyone your Instagram handle so they can come follow you, check you out, check out all the fun stuff you're doing on the court and off the court. Yeah. Yeah. Um- First of all, thank you, Michelle. This has been great. Um, you know, we I'm sure we can talk, you know, three, four hours on this stuff. But thank you again for having me on. Of course. Um, it's been super fun. Uh, my Instagram is Quinn Borchard. So basically my first and last name. Um, you can message me, ask me any questions if you like. I most likely will answer. Um, and I think if... I think James's final of the Smith Bowl will be on YouTube in a oh, couple cool. weeks. Um, so that's, if you go to the Smirk for Bowl, like if you just search on YouTube, they have every final that they've had. So if you wanted to see Alcaraz as a nine year old, wow. um, they have his 2013 final. Um, so James should be, James's one should be on there in a, in a couple of weeks. It takes him a little bit to kind of like, you know, do the editing and all that sort of thing. So if you wanted to actually see James play, um, that will be on there in a few, um, and yeah, I mean, that's pretty much what I got. Um, <laughs> you want to check out my wife on yeah, Instagram, Lindsay Brooke Design. She's uh, over a hundred thousand followers, so she's she's doing pretty good. Dang, that's um, awesome. And yeah, and like you know, like I'm I'm in Thousand Oaks, um, just a head pro at Sunset Hills Country Club. So um, just doing that, you can you can always find me. Nice. Uh, and, we uh, I'll, I'll be there for a long time. <laughs> Love it. We will add, if you're watching this episode on YouTube, we will add it right here so you can click and watch James's match. And then everything else will add in the show notes. So if you're not watching and you're listening, you can click from the audio side. And that's amazing. I love it. Awesome. Quinn, thank you so much. And happy hitting. Yay. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you so much. Ooh, go tennis. <laughs>